And one of the key words that you've mentioned already, but it's going to continue to come up tonight, is this word integration. Yes. So what is it and why do we want it and what do we look like when we have it? You can come up with a proposal that health and well-being are based in a fundamental shared mechanism called integration. Integration is where you have separate aspects of a system, let's say the system of the stage, there's Maria, there's me. For us to be integrated, we have to do two things. We have to differentiate from each other, that is, Maria as a unit of the system is going to become specialized, different, she has a different history, a different thing she does, she has different talents, different abilities, different knowledge, from me, and I differentiate from her. And so the first step is we honor each other's differences. But to be an integrated system here on the stage, we have to then link with each other in communication that's compassionate and kind and caring. So for a relationship that's integrated, you have what's called integrative communication, which is basically, by the way, a summary of the entire field of attachment research in one sentence. Secure attachment is based on integrative communication, honoring differences, promoting linkages. That's the whole thing, whether your kid is a baby or a teenager or an adult at home. Okay, so, so that's about relationships. In the body, you can look at the same thing. When the nervous system, for example, is integrated, you have the left and right different from each other, but then they're linked. The higher parts and lower parts are differentiated, but then they're linked. You can go through the whole panoply of the way the nervous system functions. Integration in the nervous system is called neural integration. And when it works well, you're having balance and coordination of the processes because they're differentiated and linked. So the key element is that integration is not the same as a smoothie. It's more like a fruit salad. Seriously. People often say, well, stick something in a blender and it's integrated. I understand they think blended and integrated are synonyms. They're not at all. Integration, you have to, by definition, maintain the differentiated elements. You don't put them in a grinder, blend them up like a smoothie. It's not homogenous. It's heterogeneous. So this is where you get the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So back in the early 90s when this started occurring to me, I started looking into the science of integration. And the only place you see it talked about, even though it's not talked about as a term, is in mathematics. And then you can extend it to physics and all these other things. And basically, here's the way it works. When systems are open and capable of chaotic behavior, they are called complex systems. And complex systems have something called an emergent property. An emergent property means there's no Microsoft that's programming something, but it's actually arising from how things happen in a system. Mm. And this property of complex systems is called self-organization. So you have this emergent property called self-organization where it turns back and regulates that from which it arose. Now, there's a lot of weird looks in the face. We don't usually talk in this kind of depth. We don't talk at all like this in the book. But the bottom line is for you, if you want to know the science of it, there's a deep science to this. Here's the take home message. When you're integrated, you're in harmony. Picture a choir coming up here. The choir singers each decide to sing how? If they're going to be integrated, how would they sing? In harmony. In harmony because they're singing the same song, that's the linkage, but they're creating intervals, these, these distances, so they're differentiated but linked. If we had this choir up here and we said, okay, all of you plug your ears really, really tightly and just belt out the same sound for like half an hour, would they be differentiated? No. Maybe. No, I'm sorry, I'm giving you this wrong. Their, their, their ears are open, they're singing out the same, the same sound the same way. Are they differentiated? No, they're singing the same note, mm -hmm. same ah, like that. Are they um, linked? Yes. But are they integrated? No. no. In this case, they get rigid. It's rigidity is one way away from integration. The other is if we have them plug their ears, sing whatever song they want, they belt out the song, and what would it sound like? Chaos. Chaos. It would be cacophony, right? So these are the two extremes away from, from harmony of integration is chaos or rigidity. The bottom line is if you think about your relationship with your children, about your family life, let's start there. When families are having challenging moments, there's chaos or there's rigidity, which means integration is impaired. Then what you do is you look for what aspect of the life of your child is not being differentiated and linked, 
-hmm. And then you make an intervention as a parent because you know about this secret in the sauce. And then you create integration where integration wasn't there. And the rigidity and the chaos go away and harmony unfolds. People get along, they're flexible, there's a sense of vitality. So in your book it looks like on, a boat is going down a river and one side of the river is very rigid and the other side is very chaotic and you want to kind of stay in the middle but occasionally yeah, you'll you, bump you, you up like right. that. Yeah, exactly. So let's do, start doing some examples because this in, idea of integration to really understand it and how we apply it with our children and in a lot of relationships actually, I found yeah. when I was reading it. Um, so one of the things is to integrate the left side of the brain with the right side of the brain. So yes. explain to me why we want to do that and examples, maybe one example of how we might do that in everyday life with our children. Sure. So, so let's just uh, underscore something. This whole approach is based on the idea that parents can be empowered by realizing that when they have knowledge about this and the skills on how to promote integration, so detect when it's not mm -hmm. going well, and do something about it, lots of stuff changes. What's interesting yes. about that is that often you see uh, a child will walk down the street and they'll stumble and fall because they haven't learned to walk yet. Mm -hmm. And you would never see a, you would rarely see a parent give that child heck. Stand yeah. up, you can't walk yet, get it together. But when a child in Safeway loses it at the till, you see them getting heck all the time. Yeah, because yeah. we as parents don't understand what you're saying, which is, that their brain isn't developed yet. In the same way as they can't walk yet, their brain isn't developed. And right. the empowering part that you're talking about is I, as a parent, actually can do something in that moment to help that child's brain know how to behave in safe way next time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so here's, the, here's the secret. As a parent, let's say you're my daughter and I'm your father. And, um, and I'm accepting that. You notice a pattern in emerging? <laughs> emerging. <laughs> we can, we'll reverse this. Okay, soon. okay, good. So, so here's what I need to realize that communication is all about how you send energy and information to someone. Always. That's all communication is. So I know I don't need a scalpel, I don't need fancy tools, I don't have to have any baby Einstein tapes. I need my relationship, which is basically based on my communication. And that's going to affect. Yeah, so now, just, just to under, you need, I mean, I'm only sharing this with you. We didn't put all this in the book because I always think, why does someone come here when they could just read a book at home by a nice fire, the rain, it's raining, you just stay at home. So, so I'm giving you a little more of the details that a publisher would always, you know, remove that and say you're going to intimidate people, but we can chat about it because we have a question and answer period. So here's how it goes. And you need to understand where this whole model comes from, you know, which we also didn't put in the book because we thought parents didn't really have much interest in that, but I assume... You have an interest in it, I hope. <laughs> so here's the, here's the story. How I communicate with my daughter is going to go in through, how is, how is Maria, my daughter, going to get the energy I send to her? Her senses. her senses. She will see me. She will hear me. If I'm touching her, she'll feel me. She can smell me. She can taste me. All these things, all the five senses, right? So energy and information literally are received by the senses. Now, we need to know that as parents. So it isn't just you know, what we say. So I can say, um, you want to give me a problem, and I'll do a left-right brain thing on it? I ha None of my friends will play with me at school anymore. There, there are three of us, and two of them are playing together, and they won't let me play with them. OK, excellent. So she comes home from school. How old are you, seven or something? I am eight. Eight, OK. <laughs> Why did I know Maria would do that? <laughs> Seven's a little young. You notice she didn't even want to stand up. <laughs> but I am, aren't I? You are, I'm yes. I'm a very yes. obedient person. No, I wouldn't call you obedient. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> no, right. Okay, that's Flexible, me. flexible. Yes. Adaptable. Adaptable, mm. yes. Okay, so now at that moment, um, what did my daughter do for me? What did she do? She sent me energy and information. What was the information all about? Rejection, exactly. So it's about... Her inner experience, her subjective experience of feeling rejected. Now, because I've read Whole Brain Child, I know. <laughs> I know that the feeling of connectedness, of relatedness, has a dominance actually in her right hemisphere. I also know, because I've read the book, that the signals that come up from her body, which include the signals from her heart, where we do literally have a, a brain around the heart. I don't know if you know that. You have a heart brain as well as an intestinal brain. And that is in part what processes our sense of rejection. And it's going to go up into her 
right brain, this right brain, over here. And I know that the, the experience she's having now is she's being flooded with a sense of rejection, which is right dominant, a feeling in her body of sadness, right dominant. And all that stuff is a raw right hemisphere response. If you want to call it an emotional response, that's fine. There's emotions on both sides of the brain. My key move as a parent is to connect with Maria. Now, because I'm an adult and I've passed through the school system, I have a hugely mm -hmm. developed left hemisphere. <laughs> it's just true. And the, the way to remember the left is there are all these L's. It's later to develop, whereas the right is? Really slow to develop. Earlier. <laughs> <laughs> the right is earlier. OK? The left is linear, so the right is holistic. The left is logical, meaning it does what's called syllogistic reasoning, looking for cause-effect relationships, solving problems. The right just takes in things as they are, so some people would say it's visual-spatial, just the impressions of how things are. The left loves making lists, like this list I'm making right now. And the right, instead, is all about autobiographical memory. It's about stress reduction. And it have, actually is the only side of the brain that has an integrated map of the whole body, only on the right side of the brain. Now, the left also is specialized in linguistics. Language with words, dominant. There's language on both sides, but it's dominant on the left. The right, in contrast, is nonverbal signals. So it's eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, posture, gestures, timing, and intensity of response. Now, I want you to do it with me. Ready? Oh, yeah, right. Come on, come on, we'll do it together. I'll show eye them contact. where the right, accents are. Come on, come on. Eye contact. Eye contact. Say it, please. Eye contact. Facial expression. Facial expressions. Tone of voice. Tone of voice. Posture. Posture. Gesture. Gesture. Timing. Timing. Intensity. Intensity. Of response. Let's do it together. I'm not going to say it this time. I'm going to point, and I'll point with you, but then you say it. Are you ready? This embeds it in your synaptic connection. And why are we doing this again? So you can remember it. Okay. <laughs> you, now I see why your friends reject you. Oh, Dad, that was a reptilian moment. <laughs> you ready? Eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, body, gesture. Timing and intensity. Beautiful. Intensity. Okay. Now, those nonverbal signals are how the right hemisphere sends messages out into the world about how it's feeling. Almost exclusively the right hemisphere. And if I blast a bunch of nonverbal signals like that to the, the recipient, in this case my daughter, it will be only her right hemisphere that can make sense of them and take them in. <laughs> 